collect, pilot? Oui, oui, monsieur. Come in. Good evening, sir. Here is Miss Eyre. Well, let Miss Eyre be seated. Tea is ready, sir, as you ordered. Miss Eyre, please come to the table. Oh, I am so sorry you had so much estate business, sir. I do wonder at your patience and perseverance in going on with it. Madam, I should like some tea. Oh, yes, of course, sir. Will you pass Mr. Rochester's cup? Adele might perhaps spill it. Have you a cadeau? A present from Mr. Eyre in your boxes? You expect a present, Miss Eyre? Are you fond of presents? I hardly know, sir. I have little experience of them. They are generally thought pleasant things. Generally thought? Well, what do you think? I am a stranger, sir. I have done nothing to entitle me to one. I don't fall back on over modesty. I've examined Adele and find you've taken great pains with her. She's not bright. She has no talents. Yet in a short while, she's made much improvement. Sir, you have given me my cadeau. Praise in my pupil's progress. Hmm. Miss Eyre, come sit here by me. You've been resident in my house three months. Yes, sir. And you come from a charitable institution. How long were you there? Eight years, sir. Eight years? You must be tenacious of life. No wonder you've rather the look of another world. When you came upon me in Hay Lane last night, I thought unaccountably of fairy tales. Who are your parents? I have none, sir. Nor ever had, I suppose. Do you remember them? No, sir. I thought not. So, you are out waiting for your people in that lane. For whom, sir? For the men in green. The men in green all forsook England a hundred years ago. The moon will never shine on their revels more. Who recommended you to come here? I advertised to Mrs. Fairfax answered my advertisement. Yes, and I am daily thankful of my choice. Don't trouble yourself to give her a character. I shall judge for myself. She began by felling my horse. Sir? She bewitched my horse. Miss Anne, you seen much society? None. Outside Lowood, now this house, sir. You read much? Only such books as came in my way. You have lived the life of a nun. No doubt you're well drilled in religious forms. Brocklehurst, do I understand, the Rex Lowood is a parson, is he not? Yes, sir. And you girls probably worshipped him. As a convent full of novices would worship their father. No, sir. They're very cool. No. What, a convent full of novices not worship their priest? I disliked Mr. Brocklehurst. He was a harsh man, at once pompous and meddling. What age were you when you went to Lowood? About ten, sir. You're now then eighteen? Yes, sir. Arithmetic, you see, is useful. Without it, I should hardly have been able to guess your age. What do you learn at Lowood? Can you play? A little. Hmm. That is the established answer. Go into the library. I mean, if you please, Miss Eyre. Excuse my tone of command. I'm used to say, do this, and it is done. I cannot alter my customary habits for one new inmate. Go then into the library. Take a candle with you, sit down at the piano, play a tune. Very well, sir.
Enough. You play a little, I see. Like any other English schoolgirl. Perhaps rather better than some, but not well. Adele showed me some sketches this morning, which she said were yours. They're on the table. Bring them. <clears throat> Are they entirely of your doing? Probably a master aided you. Certainly not, sir. Ah. Hurts pride. Now, there are three in particular. Where'd you get your copies? Out of my head, sir. That same head I now see on your shoulders? Yes, sir. Does it have any furniture of the same kind within? I should think it may have. I hope better. Were you happy when you painted these? Painting those pictures was one of the keenest pleasures I have ever known. Well, that's not saying much. Your pleasures, by your own account, have been few. You have not enough of the artist's skill and science. Yet the drawings are, for a schoolgirl, peculiar. There. Put them away. Nine o'clock. What are you about, Miss Hare, to keep Adele up so long? Take her to bed. Good me, Monsieur. I wish you all good night now. Good night, sir. Good night, sir. I enjoyed your ride, sir. I trust you've enjoyed your day, Miss Eyre. I have indeed, sir. I am so glad your leg is quite recovered. Oh, a few days were enough to put that right. All the same, you should not take risks. Otherwise, you'll bewitch my horse again. <laughs> well, excuse me, Miss Eyre, I must change my clothes. There's not much wrong with him anymore. Been out visiting, I suppose. I imagine he has to call on all the neighbouring gentry. Especially where certain young ladies are concerned. Have you heard talk of the Honourable Miss Blanche Ingram? No. Well, you will, miss. Good morning, Mr. Rochester. Here's your present. Amuse yourself with disemboweling it. Is that Miss Eyre? You wish to see me, sir? Come forward, Miss Eyre. Be seated. Don't draw the chair further off, Miss Eyre. Sit down exactly where I placed it. If you please, that is. I found these civilities. I'm always forgetting them. Oh, ciel, que c'est beau! Come, child. The master wishes to speak to Miss Eyre. You examine me, Miss Eyre. 
you find me handsome? No, sir. <laughs> By my word, there is something singular about you. You have the air of a little nun, quaint, quiet, grave, and simple, with your arms before you and your eyes generally bent on the carpet, except, by the by, when they're directed piercingly to my face, as just now. And when one asks you a question, you wrap out a brusque rejoinder. What do you mean by it? Sir, I beg your pardon. I was too plain. You are no such thing. Go on. What faults do you find with me, pray? I suppose of all my limbs and all my features, like any other man? Mr. Rochester, I intended no repartee. It was a blunder. Just so. And you shall be answerable for it. Now, ma'am, am I a fool? Far from it, sir. You might perhaps think me rude if I inquired in return whether you are a philanthropist. No, young lady, I am not in general a philanthropist. But I bear a conscience. When I was as old as you, I was a feeling fellow enough, partial to the unfledged, unfostered, and unlucky. But fortune has knocked me about since. And now I flatter myself that I'm as hard and tough as an India rubber ball. Pervious, though. Through a chink or two still. Does that leave hope for me? Hope for what, sir? Oh, you look very much puzzled, Miss Eyre. And though you're no more pretty than I am handsome, there's a puzzle that becomes you. Besides, it's very convenient. It keeps those searching eyes off my physiognomy. So, puzzle on. Young lady, I am disposed to be gregarious and communicative tonight. That's why I sent for you. The fire and the chandelier were not sufficient company for me. I can't talk to an old lady or a young child, not pilot, but you. You puzzled me the first evening I invited you down here. But please me now to draw you out to learn more of you. Therefore, speak. About what, sir? Oh, whatever you like. You're dumb, Miss Anne. Stubborn. And annoyed. Hmm? Ah, I put my request in an absurd, almost insolent form. Miss Anne, I beg your pardon. The fact is, once and for all, I do not wish to treat you like an inferior. I speak merely with 20 years more of age and a century more of experience. Now have the goodness to talk to me a little. Divert my thoughts, which are... which are galled with dwelling on one point. I am willing to amuse you if I can, sir. But how do I know what will interest you? Ask me questions, and I will do my best to answer them. Oh, firstly, then, do you agree that I have the right to be a little masterful? Abrupt, exacting at times. On the grounds that I'm old enough to be your father and have roamed over half the globe, whilst you have lived quietly with one set of people in one house. Do as you please, sir. Oh, that's no answer. It's irritating and evasive. Reply clearly. I do not think, sir, you have the right to command me because you are older than I, or because you have seen more of the world than I have. Your claim to superiority depends upon the use you have made of your time and experience. Hmm. Promptly spoken. But I won't allow that. It would never suit my case. I have made a very bad use of both advantages. Well, leaving superiority out of the question, then. You must still agree to receive my orders now and then without being piqued by the tone of command. Why do you smile? I was thinking, sir, that very few masters would trouble themselves to inquire so of their paid subordinates. Paid subordinate? Oh, yes, I'd forgotten the salary. Well, then, on that mercenary ground, will you agree to let me hector you a little? No, sir. Not on that ground. 
fact on the grounds that you did forget it and that you care whether or not a dependent is comfortable in his dependency. And will you agree to dispense with a great many conventional forms and phrases without thinking me insolent? I hope so. I know the difference between informality and insolence. The one I rather like, the other nothing freeborn would submit to even for a salary. Humbug. Most things freeborn will submit to anything for a salary. However, I mentally shake hands with you for that answer, despite its inaccuracy. Not one in 3,000 raw schoolgirl governesses would have answered me as you have just done. However, I don't mean to flatter you. For all I know, you may have intolerable faults to counterbalance your few good points. Oh. Yes, yes, you're right. I have plenty of faults of my own. I was thrust onto a wrong tack at the age of 21 and have never recovered the right course since. I might have been different. I might have been as good as you. Wiser. Almost as stainless. I envy you your peace of mind. Your clean conscience your unpolluted memory. How was your memory when you were 18, sir? Oh, I was your equal, Miss Eyre. Quite your equal. Nature meant me to be, on the whole, a good man, Miss Eyre. But you see, I am not. I am a trite, commonplace sinner, hackneyed in all the petty dissipations of the rich and worthless. I wish I'd stood firm. God knows I do. Dread remorse when you are tempted to err, Miss Eyre. Remorse is the poison of life. Repentance is said to be its cure, sir. It is not its cure. Reformation, maybe. I could reform, but what's the use? Hampered, burdened. Cursed as I am. Besides, I have a right to get pleasure out of life, and I will get it, cost what it may. Then you will degenerate still further, sir. Why should I? If I can get sweet, fresh pleasure, and I may get it. As sweet and fresh as the wild honey that bee gathers on the moor. You are like a little bird trapped in a cage, vivid, resolute, restless, but a captive. Were it but free, I would soar cloud high. To speak truth, sir, I do not understand you. Well, at this moment, Miss Eyre, I am paving hell with energy. Sir? I'm laying down good intentions which I believe as durable as flint. Are you afraid of me because I talk like a sphinx? Your language is enigmatical, sir. Though I am bewildered, I'm certainly not afraid. Voici, mademoiselle. Where are you going? To put Adele to bed. It is past her time. She's beautiful, is she not? A miniature of her mother. A little seductress. Sir? Never mind, I shall explain someday. Good night, Miss Eyre. Good night, sir. Keep still, Adele. Keep still.
Que se passe-t-il, mademoiselle Je commence à avoir froid. Me rest for a moment, Adele. I promised you an explanation, Miss Anne. Your pupil, Adele, is the daughter of a French opera dancer, Céline Varon, for whom I once cherished a grand passion. No reproof, Monsieur. No moral homily. No, sir. I like this day. I like this sky of steel. I like Thornfield. My home as it could be. Yet how long have I abhorred the very thought of it? Shunned it like a plague house. Feared it. Feared it, sir. I was speaking of Celine Varon. I called one evening when she didn't expect me and found her with another man. Mademoiselle. Thank you, Adele. Oh. Go and read your book, child. He was a cavalry officer. A brainless and vicious youth. A woman that could betray me with such a rival was not worth contending for. I paid her off. You never felt jealousy, did you, Miss Eyre? No. Of course not. You never felt love. I'm so ignorant of the world. Perhaps I should have guessed at something of the sort. Now you know she is the illegitimate offspring of a French opera girl, you will perhaps think differently of your post and your protégé. You'll be coming to me with notice you intend to leave, that you've found another position, that you beg me to look out for a new governess, hmm? No, sir. Adele is not answerable for either her mother's faults or yours. I have a regard for her. Now that I know she is, in a sense, parentless, Forsaken by her mother and disowned by you, sir, I will cling even closer to her than before. Sir? Mr. Barrow, the agent's here, sir. He said you wish to see him at once. Yes, I do. Put him in the library. Thank you, Miss Hare.
This is not one of your witchery, you sorceress. I heard someone creeping in the corridor. I heard a terrible laugh. Whoever it was set fire to your room and then fled through the door to the upper staircase. Shall I fetch Mrs. Fairfax? What the deuce for? What can she do before morning? Oh, Let her sleep. You will wake no one. Here. Here, put this around you. Sit down. And stay where you are till I return. Don't move. And don't call anyone. <laughs> <laughs> 